blowing the whistle while black. Sort of sounds like riding your bike while black, flying while black, singing a song while black. I'm going to be honest with you. There's absolutely nothing I can do without being black. <laughs> can't help myself. Can't help myself. When it comes to doing your job while black, you have to be careful. It's sort of like walking while black. You make the wrong step, and things can just happen. I'm here to tell you about what happens when just doing everyday tasks while black can be a matter of life or death. Now, I will be the first to tell you that black people are not the only folks discriminated against and retaliated against. Not by a long shot. I have heard horror stories about whistleblowers and the abuse that they receive, no matter the hue of their skin. But whenever someone black blows the whistle, the hue of their skin is always an issue. Versus when someone white blows the whistle, rarely, if ever, the hue of their skin is part of the equation. So tenacious is the issue of being black that the United Nations has a 10-year program going on right now to address all of black people throughout the diaspora, throughout the country, throughout the world, and their condition. So nasty is the way employers treat their employees in general. Whistleblowing is a specific task force at the United Nations. So I ask you to just sit with me for a minute, to listen just for my story, my story about what it means to be a black woman working for the federal government. When I was in the eighth grade, I loved government. Sort of got it from my father. My father was a historian. And he loved to tell stories, too. And I would always hear these wonderful stories from my father. And I saw this woman in the 1970s who wanted to be president of the United States. Her name was Shirley Chisholm. And she was unbought and unbossed. Hot dog. I just wanted to be like her. I looked up to her. And not too long after that, I decided to pursue a career in public service. And in that career, I went from being a clerk typist got my undergraduate degree, got my master's degree, and became a senior contracting officer in the IRS. That's a tax man, y'all. That's like real big stuff. And I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. Well, let me tell you something. I was simply a pawn in the game of politics and money. You see, and around 1994, 95, President Clinton was in office. And he had a vision of reinventing government to make it work better and cost less. And because I had been so successful, I was assigned to a special project. And that special project was to oversee the simplified tax and wage reporting system. Simplified taxes. That meant that we wanted to make it easier and harmonize, I love that term, harmony, the wage code. Well, I was invited to meet President Clinton. It was such an honor. He walked right up to me and shook my hand. I didn't feel like washing it for at least a couple days. <laughs> After that event, Treasury officials came to IRS people and they asked if I could be transferred over to work directly with Treasury and then directly with the White House. What an honor, or so I thought. Next day, Arnie, my boss, who was quite the looker,
folk thought he was. He was tall and dark and handsome and smiled real nice-like. I always thought that smile had something else behind it. And that day I would learn that, in fact, it did. Arthuretta, the customer, would like the major contract on that project you're working on to be extended. What? Extended? Arnie, the contract has died. I'm in the process of working it out so that we close it out. Surely there's something else we can do? No, no, I want it extended. But it would be an illegal action. I don't care, don't come to me with problems. I only want solutions from you. I went back to the office, talked to some of my coworkers, and they came up with what we thought would be the perfect solution. Arnie, Arnie, I have a solution. How about this? You know, like other contracting officers, we're not always comfortable with signing contract auctions that may be a little questionable. How about if I prepare all the paperwork for the project, and I will prepare it for your signature, you will sign it, you will not have to do any of the work, but I'm really not comfortable with this. Arnie smiled and said, okay, all right. Within a week, I would be off the project. One week. Within a week, they began negative recordation on my personnel records. Within a week, I was ostracized and left alone to be alienated from my coworkers. I believed in the system. I filed one complaint after another, one grievance after another. Didn't matter. Five years it took for me to get through that system. I got sick, lost hair, developed all kinds of medical problems, but I hung in there. Five years, an administrative law judge, not an administrative judge from the EEOC or the MSPB, the Merit System Protection Board, or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that the federal government establishes. No, I saw an impartial administrative law judge who heard the whole story, asked the questions, well, why did you want her to extend the contract? No answer. Why did you remove her off the project? No answer. I won that case. I thought I had won the war. No. I had only won that battle. After that, Arnie got promoted. Imagine that. But there was a ripple effect in the organization. Other people got promoted. I had to leave because although I won, I had still not received compensation for the harm that had been done to me. That's what discrimination looks like. It's when someone pushes you aside, treats you different, ostracizes you for a thing and a reason they should not. Be it your race, be it your gender, be it your sexual orientation, whatever it is, discrimination hurts. And so do these systems that they have designed for us to get redress as required by the First Amendment. So you see, they may meet the requirement of the First Amendment in word, but in deed, they do another thing. <sighs> Post-traumatic stress disorder is one of the consequences of blowing the whistle and filing discrimination complaints. And when I went through all of what I went through in the sickness and illness, the one thing I learned was that there were a lot of people just like me out there who were suffering at the hands of government when government was supposed to be there to help you. I was a lemon from one place to another. I was a lemon, but let me tell you something. I was not going to let them break me. I got together with a lot of other lemons and we became the lemon crew. And that Lemon Crew is called the Coalition for Change. 
We want to change this system to make it better. You see, in these systems that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the Merit System Protection Board, less than 2% of all cases are won. And less than 1% of all cases of people that look like me win. What does that mean for the greater society? It means that income disparity is continually growing. Because see, when you take away somebody's livelihood, you affect their children and their children's children. And when you have systems designed to discriminate, and the only way that someone can stay in that system is to do what you say do, public policy is adversely affected. So you see, income disparity in this country is not a matter of lack of education or experience. It is designed that way. So the Coalition for Change says we are going to make a difference and we are going to change it. And what the founder and chairperson and president and the beautiful person that began the Coalition for Change said, I'm going to take all these lemons and we're going to mix it together and we're going to put a little sugar in it, which makes it the love. And we're going to make some lemonade. And we're going to work together, and we're going to support each other, and we're going to love each other through this process, notwithstanding all that we are going through. We are going to take care and be the nourishment for each other. So in the one thing that I would like all of you all to do is to understand that if one of us is hurting, all of us are hurting. This is not a matter of just being black, this is a matter of standing up for what is right for all people. Mr. Frederick Douglass had a message for us, not just when he lived, but what he lived for. And that is to understand that if there is no struggle, there will be no progress. You cannot, cannot want progress and change without agitation. So, my friends, if you want this system of whistleblowing to change in this country, if you want to give your children a country that we right now want to be better, you all must agitate, agitate, agitate.